Forgiveness lies at the heart of the gospel, and yet I regularly meet people who doubt that their sins are forgiven. Nobody denies that we need forgiveness. We have a built-in sense of need for the pardon that's offered in the gospel. But we wrestle with the question, has God forgiven my sin? If we can't answer that question, then that raises another question for us. How? His question really strikes at the heart of the issue. In order for God to completely forgive our sins, what must we do? This young man was very troubled over his sins. He was especially troubled that he could not remember every sin so that he could repent of every one. His anxiety came from something he had been taught by his church. You see, this young man believed that you can be forgiven of your sins by the atonement of Jesus Christ through the process of repentance. You might say that he took this too literally. After all, Heavenly Father knows our hearts. How could a person claim to be doing their best if they were not trying as hard as this young man? It would seem that anything less than this young man's intense effort, anything short of trying to remember every single sin and repent of every one of them, would in fact mean you weren't doing your best. In his book, The Miracle of Forgiveness, Spencer Kimball said, there is one crucial test of repentance. This is abandonment of the sin. The saving power does not extend to him who merely wants to change his life, nor is repentance complete when one merely tries to abandon sin. To try is weak. To do the best I can is not strong. We must always do better than we can. So then this young man wasn't taking it too literally. He was giving an honest effort to abandon all his sin. In fact, compared to him, many people treat their sin and their need to repent with entirely too much indifference. And furthermore, if repeating the sin brings all former sins back, undoing any forgiveness that we may have experienced in the past then we must be even more careful, relentless, I would say, in trying to repent of all of our sins. Doctrines and Covenants 82.7 says, And now verily I say unto you, I, the Lord, will not lay any sin to your charge. Go your way and sin no more, but unto that soul who sinneth, shall the former sins return.
saith the Lord your God. Man's faith placed him in a pressure cooker situation. The pressure of trying to eradicate all sin in his life brought him near the snapping point. Someone has accurately characterized this as the impossible gospel. Verses 27 through 32 explain just how perfect a man must be before he is truly ready to meet God. Have ye walked, keeping yourselves blameless before God? Could ye say, if ye were called to die at this time within yourselves, that ye have been sufficiently humble? That your garments have been cleansed and made white through the blood of Christ, who will come to redeem his people from their sins? Behold, are ye stripped of pride? I say unto you, if ye are not, ye are not prepared to meet God. Behold, ye must prepare quickly, for the kingdom of heaven is soon at hand, and such an one hath not eternal life. Behold, I say, is there one among you who is not stripped of envy? I say unto you that such an one is not prepared, and I would that he should prepare quickly, for the hour is close at hand, and he knoweth not when the time shall come, for such an one is not found guiltless. And again I say unto you, is there one among you that doth make a mock of his brother, or that heapeth upon him persecutions? Woe unto such an one, for he is not prepared. And the time is at hand that he must repent, or he cannot be saved. Yea, even woe unto all ye workers of iniquity. Repent, repent, for the Lord God hath spoken it. Now, if forgiveness comes through the atonement of Jesus Christ, and if the atonement of Christ does not fully apply until the individual repents, and if repentance means eradicating all sin, then it is impossible to obtain the forgiveness of Christ ever. Now I'll be the first to admit that God's law does in fact demand perfection. James chapter 2 and verse 10 makes this very plain. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. The Apostle Paul plainly expressed the impossibility of eradicating all of our sins. In the seventh chapter of Romans, Paul said this, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law, that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. Here is the Apostle Paul, in front of God and everybody, confessing his own inability to overcome sin in his own life, to free himself from captivity, to free himself from the slavery that he was in to sin. Apparently, the Apostle Paul did not believe that he himself had eradicated all sin in his life. And furthermore, he didn't believe that was possible. Thankfully, the gospel found in God's word is neither hopeless nor is it impossible.
In Romans 7, when the Apostle Paul bewailed his own personal bent towards sinning, he cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then in the very next verse, he answered his own question, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Eradicating sin never was, never has been God's purpose for the law. The law cannot justify anyone. The law can only condemn. The law says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The Bible says in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That is good news. And that is because God did not give us the law in order to show us how we could be forgiven. God gave us the law for an entirely different reason. Romans 3.19 says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. God gave us the law to show us our sin and our guilt. In Romans 7 and verse 7, the Bible says, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. The law only works in one direction. It does nothing to remove sin from us. The law only works to make us know that we have sinned to show us that we've sinned. If my car breaks down on a dark night, and I get out my flashlight and look at the engine, my flashlight won't fix my engine. It will only show me if there's a problem. But the Bible tells us in Galatians 4 and verse 4, but when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. You see, only Christ is able to justify us. In Romans 8 and verse 3, the Bible says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. Romans 10 and verse 4 says, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And this is how. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him find an amazing truth in this verse. Because the Bible makes it very clear that mankind is wicked, wretched, the enemy of God. Our hearts are opposed to God and most unworthy of His grace. When we consider ourselves in the light of Scripture, we see that God has every reason to abandon us and absolutely no reason to provide us with salvation. And yet, Romans chapter 5 tells us that when we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. That same chapter, a few verses later, goes on to say that God commended or demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Notice that. While we were yet sinners, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Bible says in Romans 5, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Compare that to what Moroni 10.32 says. Yea, come unto Christ and be perfected in Him, and deny yourselves of all ungodliness, if ye shall deny yourselves 
of all ungodliness and love God with all your might, mind, and strength, then is his grace sufficient for you that by his grace ye may be perfect in Christ. Do you see the difference? Romans 5 says that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. What good is the grace of God if it can't overcome our sin? If we have to overcome our sin ourselves in our own strength, and God's grace can't work until we've done the cleaning up ourselves, then what is God's grace for? You see, Jesus Christ reminded us that doctors are not for the healthy. No doctor demands that his patients eradicate their illnesses before they can come in for an appointment, before he'll give them the medicine that they need. Our Lord Jesus Christ prescribes grace for the sinner, not for the righteous. Grace is what we need. Grace is the medicine, the balm, the, the prescription that is needed to heal us from our sins. In 1 Peter 2.24, the Bible says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Those stripes refer to the cruel suffering that Christ endured at the hands of the men who scourged him with the cat of nine tails, who beat him with their fists, who put a crown of thorns on his head, who spit in his face, who mocked him, who nailed him to the cross, and who pierced his side. We are healed by those stripes, by the wounds Christ received at his crucifixion. Christ's wounds and the blood that he shed while he was suffering for our sins, those are the wounds that heal us. They heal us because Christ received those wounds in our place as our substitute for our sin. We are the sinners. We sinned against God. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. But on the cross, the Bible teaches that he bore our sins in his own body, as if he himself had been the one to commit those sins. In Isaiah 53, 5, the Bible says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. There on the cross, he spread his arms open wide and took all our sins to himself as if they were his own. And then Christ sunk into the grave, taking our sins with him. And on the third day, Jesus Christ rose again from the grave, leaving our sins behind and paid for. Trying to gain forgiveness by repentance is like trying to purge your memory with an ice pick. It only causes torture and torment and damage to yourself. How many find themselves in total despair because they cannot purge all their sins from their life? How many use antidepressants? How many entertain suicidal thoughts? If we want forgiveness, we must cast our sins on Jesus Christ. He paid for the sin. We must place our sins on Jesus. Of course, we cannot hold on to our sins and expect to be forgiven of them at the same time, just as we cannot eat our cake and save it for later both at the same time. But when we cast our sins on Jesus, he forgives. He removes those sins from us 